Uh, I want to say thanks to everybody joining us on live stream. We're so grateful that you're here, but I just want to invite you to come out and actually join us in service. We would love to have you be our guest, and I'd love to see you this coming Sunday, so that'd be awesome. All right, let's dive into the message for tonight. Uh, I know that on Wednesday nights, pastor's been doing a little bit of teaching on authority and the believer's authority, and I was asked to speak on the authority structure that God has put inside of the family. And I'm excited to do that. So we're going to talk about the authority structure of the family according to God's word. And to do this properly, we need to go all the way back to the beginning of the Bible in Genesis. And we need to understand what authority is at its core. And I think this is really cool. In Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and I'm reading from the NIV uh, just in case you're caught off guard by the way this is wrote. It says this, Then God said... Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so we are image bearers of God. God says this. We're going to make something unique out of all creation. God created everything. And out of all creation, he said, we're going to make something special. And we're going to make this in our image, in our likeness. They are going to bear our image. And he made humans. So that they may rule. So we are image bearers, and God says that he made us in his image so that we may rule, so that we may have authority. And that verse goes on to say over pretty much creation. He's giving us rulership and authority over creation. But authority is part of us bearing the image of God. I think that's incredibly important for us to understand As we go into this talk about what the authority structure in the family is, according to God's word, we need to first realize that when we live out or use authority, we are reflecting the image of God. And this is so vital. And and we're going to talk about this authority structure and how God sets it up, and then we're going to look at Jesus and get a real good idea of how authority should look in our lives, wherever it is. And so... We need to understand that as Christians, authority is given from God so that we can bear his image. That's what Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says. He created us in his image and likeness so that we could rule and have authority. All right, with that in place, we're going to go to Ephesians 5, 21. And we're actually going to read from two different scriptures tonight. And I love this because Paul writes both of these letters. And in Ephesians, I'm pretty confident that he's writing to the women And then he's going to write the exact same thing in Colossians, but I think he's writing to the men. You'll find out why when we read it. Ephesians 5, 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So I want to just start off right there. We are all image bearers. Every single one of us, every person on the planet is an image bearer of God. We have all been given authority to walk out in this planet. The degree of authority, where that authority works, where we have authority given to us, that's different. If you are a business owner, you have a level of authority that I don't have because I'm not a business owner. I'm an employer. You see what I'm saying? So there's different authority types, but every person created in the image of God has authority to rule in the world in some way. And so Paul starts off and he says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, there's this acknowledgement that all of us are image bearers. And there's this mutual submitting one to another in the church that we need to understand. And and this is kind of his setup for laying out the structure of the family. And so he wanted to start us off on an even playing field. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now we're going to read all the way through this. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And all the men said, Amen. And Paul kept going. That was a joke. You just got yourself in trouble, whoever did that. Paul continues, Husbands! I want to point this out too. He uses three verses to tell the women their responsibility. He uses, if my memory is correct, eight to tell the men. So... And all the women said, amen, yes. Uh, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Wait a minute, Paul. 
to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Continue on to chapter 6. Children! Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And all the parents said, Amen. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Verse 4, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And all the children said, yes and amen. That was how he wrote it to the Ephesians. For kicks and giggles, let's read how he read it or wrote it to Colossians. Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. The end. That is quite a stark difference. You know what I'm saying? That's why Ephesians is for the women that like the details. Here's what you're going to do. Here's why you're going to do it. Colossians is for the men that just say, give me the rule and I'll roll with it. I don't need all the fluff. At least that's my interpretation of it. In Ephesians, we discover the biblical authority structure in the family. That first it is Christ. He is the head of every family. And then the man... And then the woman, and then the children. And most of you here, that is not a shocking revelation. We kind of have already known this. But what I want to do tonight is encourage us to relook at this authority structure in view of the way we exercise and use our authority must reflect the image of God because we're Christians. And so within the husband and the wife, There's a clear authority structure that the man is the head underneath Christ. But yet there's this weird thing that we got to wrestle with. Is that later on in this same exact chapter, Paul says something mysterious happens. That this one person, this one complete whole person that's a man is going to marry this one complete whole person that's a woman. And they're going to become one flesh. This one new thing. Which for me makes me stop and go, this is kind of weird to be like, you're one, but one of you's authority over the other one. And so here's what I want to show. Here's what I want to help you grab a hold of. Authority, when man is the chief authority of the home underneath Christ, it is not saying that the woman is inferior to the man. That's not what Paul's saying at all. In fact, Paul starts his whole argument by saying there needs to be a mutual submission one to another. And then he does clarify for us that in this mutual submission, the man is still the head of the home. At the end of the day, that man is responsible. But then he goes on to explain what this responsibility looks like to a man. And it looks a whole lot like dying. He says, you got to lay yourself down. You've got to You've got to serve her. You've got to love her as if she is your own body. So here's what we discover from Paul in these scriptures. I'm going to give you four things that we kind of can pick up on if we look at this. The first thing is this, that our use of authority should reflect the heart of God, as we've already declared. The second thing is this, is that if you look at what Paul says, there's equal respect, honor, and value given to both the husband and the wife, and there has to be because you're one. You're one person. You're still your own personalities and stuff, but it's kind of, Paul says, this is like the church in Christ. We are in him and he is in us, but yet we're still, we're still our own person. We're not robots anymore. And he says, somehow there's this mystery within marriage that this happens. And we discover in scripture that we're to actually work together in unity. 
So this authority structure doesn't really look like a tyrant or a dictator. It looks like two people coming together under submission to Christ saying, where is God leading our family? And then we're working together to go there with the ultimate acknowledgement that at the end of the day, the man needs to have the final say. But it's not contrary to the wife's input, right? So there's this, Paul's building up both. In fact, I would go so far as to say this, that what Paul shows men is that our role is actually to elevate our wives in the family. That we're actually to lift them up and to boost them up. And to show our children that, hey, when you see her, you better see me. We're, we're on the same team. With my kids, we tell them that mom and dad are the coaches and you're the players on the team. You listen to both of us. And we tell them the same instructions so that they're not confused. There is equal respect, honor, and value given to both husband and wife. And if I can explain it this way, when I say that the wife's not inferior, David is, a, what's the word? He's, he's higher up than me in the food chain at the church. He's a superior to me when it comes to authority. If David comes and tells me to do something, I have to listen to what David says. I do not have that authority towards David. But that doesn't mean that I'm less in value, less in worth, or less as a human because he has greater authority than I do. And that's what Paul's trying to say is that husbands, we cannot treat our wives like they're inferior to us just because God says you have the greater authority in the home. Right? There's this elevation. And then we also see that there's a responsibility that we have as husbands to live a life worthy of our wives submitting. This is actually one of my points. Authority doesn't negate the responsibility to bear well the image of God. It's kind of like this. I don't get to sit as a father or as a husband in my chair of authority and just tell my wife, do whatever I want you to. Go make me a sandwich. Go, go, I don't like the way the kitchen looks. Go clean it. I, that's, not, that's not what Paul is saying to us when he says that the, the man is the head of the house, right? He, he's saying we're the ones that lay ourselves down. So authority doesn't negate responsibility to bear well the image of God. We don't get to do what we want because we have authority, our authority is submitted to the will of God, the heart of God, and the nature of God as revealed in Christ Jesus. Just because God gives us authority isn't a free pass to just treat people how we want to. And this is key in the family. Here's a little bit of insight for you. God establishes authority in our lives. He establishes the family structure. And then God goes and actually he authorizes an authority structure, a flow chart in your home. And he puts the fathers at the top. I don't think it's a coincidence that when Jesus taught us about the father, he revealed him as a father. Amen. He said, our father in heaven. Jesus was showing us that as we are Bearing the image of God in the use of our authority that we are a reflection of what our heavenly father is like. Because we're bearing his image. And Jesus wanted us to see God as a father. And so I think as, as men especially, because I'm a man, I think we have to take what Paul's saying very seriously. And we have to really form how we walk in this authority that Scripture says we have based on Jesus. Paul goes on to tell children, hey, you need to honor your parents. You need to obey them. But then he tells parents, don't be harsh to them. Don't exasperate them. They'll become discouraged and disheartened. No, you just train and teach them. You raise them up in the ways of God, right? Scripture says to to raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And so we have to reframe the way that we parent in view of Jesus and how Jesus used his authority. So in Paul's writings, again, we discover that our use of authority should reflect the heart of God. And this goes outside of the family structure. This goes to everything because we're bearing his image wherever we have authority. 
that within the family, there's equal respect, honor, and value given to both the husband and the wife, that children obey parents with honor and respect as unto God, and authority doesn't negate the responsibility to bear well the image of God. What I want to do now is I want to take us to Jesus, and I want us to take a good look at how Jesus showed us that the authority works. And for us to really be able to grab a hold of this, we have to acknowledge something, that Jesus is in absolute the top position of authority. There's no one anywhere ever that has more authority than Jesus. He is top, right? We're all on the same page. Amen. Good. Very good. This is going to go well. So when we want to know how to use our authority as husbands and wives and how we're supposed to treat one another and then how we're supposed to use that authority when raising our kids, we need, we, we need to really go look at Jesus and see what he says. And the first thing we need to understand is that when we see Jesus, we see the Father. And so if we want to know what God wants us to do with this authority, then we need to go look at Jesus. In John 14, verse 5, Thomas, good old Dalton Thomas, Thomas said to him, Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered and said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. And then Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered him, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. So when Jesus was human, we understand that he was fully human and fully God. But what we discover here is that even though Jesus was fully God, when he was in his incarnate state, he says, everything I'm doing, I'm doing it on the authority of the Father. And when you look at me, you see him. So if we want to know what God is like with all his power and his authority to rule and reign over us, we can look at Jesus and be confident that we are getting a clear picture of how we are supposed to use authority especially within the family. We're going to go to Matthew 20, verse 25. I'm going to give you two examples of how Jesus teaches us to use our authority. I'm going to start in verse 20. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, who were two of the disciples, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him, Jesus. What is, you, what is it you want, he asked. She said, grant me, or grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your kingdom. So they're, they're coming and they're going, we know your kingdom's coming and we know you're the boss, and I want my sons to be right next to you. Your right hand and your left hand. I want them to be the ones in charge. Jesus responds in verse 22, you don't know what you are asking. Jesus said to them, can you drink the cup I am going to drink, talking about his crucifixion? And they ignorantly responded, we can Verse 23, Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Verse 24, when the ten, so the other ten disciples, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. So there's this twelve inner circle, and these, these disciples, I don't think they were stupid. Ignorant sometimes, for sure, but not stupid. They know Jesus is talking about, my kingdom's coming, I'm coming in power, and they're looking around going, hey guys, we're the only ones going with him everywhere he's going. Like, we're the inner, we're going to be the ones at the top of the food chain. 
And out of those 12, two of them get the bright idea to go up to Jesus and be, hey, by the way, we'd really like to be the ones over everyone else, if that's possible. Jesus says, you guys don't know what you're asking for. And then Jesus teaches them something really powerful about authority. Jesus called them together, all 12 of them, because they're arguing now. And he says, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Immediately, remember, Israel is being occupied by Rome at this point. So when Jesus says, you know how the Gentiles lord their power and their authority over their people. And immediately the disciples would go, yeah, they, they oppress them. They rip them off. They take all these taxes. They, they cheat them. They would immediately start to think of this. And what are they doing it for? These lords and these people in power are taking from the poor and the less powerful to benefit themselves. And Jesus says, you know how those guys do that, how they use their power to benefit themselves? And they would have been nodding their head, yes, Jesus, we know what you're talking about. And Jesus says this, not for you. No, that is not what you are going to be like. And see, the disciples don't know this yet, but Jesus is setting them up to be his apostles when he goes to heaven to be with the Father. These are the guys that are going to be running the church. And Jesus knows that he's prepping them for this work, and he lets them know, hey, Gentiles, unbelievers, people that are far from God and don't know God, that's how they use authority, is to just oppress people, to hold them down, and to prop themselves up. You're not going to be like that. He says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. According to what Paul wrote about the authority structure in the home, we can read what Jesus just said and say, we need to apply this to how we live this out in our family. That those in authority aren't to lord it over them, right? Doesn't that tie in with what Paul's saying? Don't be harsh with your children. Don't, don't, Don't exasperate them, but train them and teach them and nurture them in the ways of God. Jesus says, not so with you. You're not going to abuse your authority and your power over others. In fact, if you want to be great, you'll become like the least. John chapter 13. Jesus is going to give yet another example of what authority is supposed to be used for. And remember, when we look at Jesus, we're seeing the Father in heaven. He's revealing to us what God is like, and we've already agreed that God is in absolute authority over everything, and we just get glimpses of him and the authority that he allows us to operate in, right? But he's the one at the top. In John 13, it's very familiar. Jesus washes his disciples' feet. It was just before the Passover festival and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. That's interesting. He put all things under his power. Jesus has ultimate authority. And that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. And Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he pulled on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. And look at what he says. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, 
for that is what I am. Jesus says that you call me two titles that imply that I'm the one in authority. You call me teacher, which means I'm the one authorized to teach, and you call me Lord, which is the acknowledgement of his sovereign authority over their lives, right? You call me teacher and Lord, and Jesus says, and you're absolutely right. I am the one with the authority. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Let me ask you a question. Because to be sure... Authority means we have to make decisions, means we have to set guidelines, and we have to set boundaries. And parents, you're responsible for setting those things in place so that your children can't just do whatever they want to do. There's things out there that will hurt them. And so we set boundaries in place because God has established us as the authority to do so, right? And Jesus says that I'm the one in authority. You call me teacher and Lord, and you are correct in calling me that. Here's the question. When Jesus got out of the chair and took on the position of the servant, did he lose his authority? No. Rather, he displayed the heart of God in the use of authority, and it's to serve. And as Christians... We don't just look at this and say, it'd be easy for me to pull David up here and to be like, David, let me wash your feet. But when my children are being disrespectful and rebellious, am I going to pull my son up here and be like, you know what? Let me wash your feet. Is that that my heart towards my wife? Because this is what Paul communicated to us is that wives submit to your husband, but Jesus says the one in authority is the one that should get down and serve. And Paul echoes that, and he says, don't just serve, lay your life down. Like, you love your wife like Jesus Christ loved the church. I have the authority in my home. Am I going to use that authority to abuse and mistreat my family? because I have the authority? Or am I going to be like Christ and use my authority to bless them and to serve them? This is what Paul's communicating to us in Ephesians and in Colossians. This is what Jesus reveals to us. Can I, can I tell you that fathers especially, there's research out there, you can go look this up, but But do you know that the way you treat your children when you claim to be a Christ follower actually affects the way they view God? Wow. I need to make sure that even though I can claim I'm the authority in my home, that I do less of this and more of this. And here's the real simple like application point. Any of us here who aren't just trying to be that one teenager that always, you know, has to be the, ah, I'll do the thing you don't want. Any of us here, if I said, what kind of household do you want to grow up in? The one where your father just sits in a chair all the time and says, do this, do that. Come wash my feet, son. Get over here and wash my feet. Or, or would you rather grow up in the home where your father comes up and says, I got rules and boundaries. I'm an authority, but I want you to know that I love you. I'm here for you, and I'm going to be the one that blesses you. I'm going to be the one that protects you. I'm going to be the one that provides for you. You don't have to worry about a thing. When daddy's here, daddy's got your back. Daddy's not going to mistreat you. Daddy's not going to be harsh with you. Daddy's going to show you what God is like. Mothers, God bless you, you, if you, you know, like my wife, she's at home all day. I don't know how she does it. God's got special grace for women that stay home all day with their kids. But how do you want your kids to view God? Because some of you are in a situation where there's not a father present. 
And your kids are going to look to you to see what God is like because you also are an image bearer. And in that situation, you are the ultimate authority. Do you want to be the type of mother that's, come wash my feet, kid. Just do what I tell you to. I don't care what you think. Just do what I tell you to. Or do you want to be the type of mother that does more of this and your kids see what God is like? Now, I'm not perfect at this. I'm really not perfect at it, especially when I'm on little sleep. But this is what we see in Scripture. This is what authority in the family is supposed to look like. That we are demonstrating to our children within the structure and the safety of our family that that's what God is like. That he's not an authoritative, harsh, exasperating type figure who demands you come and wash his feet. No, he's the type of God that even though he has all authority, he'll lay his life down. That's what authority has been given to us to do, is to reflect our Father. And so when it comes to the authority structure in the house and the authority that we have as parents, as husbands, as wives, and the children absolutely honor and respect your parents for this is right, it pleases the Lord, and added bonus, you're going to set yourself up for a pretty good life when you do that according to Scripture. So you should rock that boat, but, but all of us would agree we'd rather live in the home where we see more of that serving type heart than the authoritative abuse of power, just do what I say. We would all say, yeah, we'd rather have that, which is why we got to keep looking to Jesus. Because it's very easy to drift out of that. But Jesus said he came to show us the abundant way. And I'm convinced the more that we come to Jesus and say, I'm not really good at this part of getting off the chair and serving. But see, I don't lose my authority when I get off my chair and I bless my wife or bless my children. And mothers, you don't lose your authority over the children when you get down and serve them, right? We're not losing authority. Jesus didn't lose his authority. Actually, he revealed the greatest use of authority, bless and serve. Amen. And I just want to, I want to pray for all of us that we would grab a hold of this and that we would use wisdom from the Holy Spirit as we live out this authority that we've been given, because you have been given it. Parents, you have been given it. Don't let your kids run your house. But run your house, reflecting first upon how God uses his authority, and then reflect that to your children and to your spouse. That's what scripture calls us to as Christians. And I'm confident that because Jesus is leading us into the abundant life, that if we will do this, that if we'll seek God and become those types of families, not only will our families be blessed, not only will our spouses be blessed, not only will our children be blessed, but the families that see you, imagine the witness that they're going to see. Imagine your kids when they're over at a friend's house and their friend's parents are those authoritative ones that are just barking orders and telling them to come wash their feet. And your kids are like, wow, my parents aren't like this at all. And then their kids are like, well, what are your parents like? And you're like, my parents are really nice and they love me. And they, yeah, they got rules, but they don't treat me like that. What kind of witness are we to the world when they see the heart of God revealed in the way that we use our authority and the family structure that God has put in place? So I'm going to pray for us that, that the Holy Spirit will move on our hearts. And here's how I want to encourage you, because as I share this, I got convicted just writing the message. I was like, man, there's some things I've really messed up with my kids. And I'm new at this. So I can imagine that some of you who have teenagers now, you might feel like, wow, I kind of blown this a little bit. That's okay, because God redeems the time. God will show you how to heal everything. I mean, he's just really good at reconciling. That's what he does. And so I'm going to pray that those of you that feel like maybe you've blown it, that you'd find grace in Jesus and that you would know that God will heal whatever wounds there are. God can do that if we just continually seek him. But we have to be the ones to make the decision to yield to what the Holy Spirit's leading us to and to honor God with the image-bearing that he's given us in authority. So let's, let's pray together. Father, 
I thank you so much for your word, God. I thank you that it is life to us, Father, that it reveals to us the way, the truth, and the life, that it reveals your son to us and that your son, Jesus, reveals you. Father, and I'm so thankful that you are not harsh and abusive with your authority over our lives, but you are full of grace and mercy and forgiveness and compassion. And Father, I pray that as we seek to live the authority that you've given us in our families, that Father, we would be led by your spirit, Father, and that we would be like Christ. And even though we have the authority, Father, that we would use it to serve and to bless and be like you. May we reflect well the image that we bear. For those here today, Father, that feel like they've blown it, God, I pray that they'd find hope in you. God, you are full of grace. And it's never too late for us to repent and acknowledge where we've missed the mark. And, and you can come in and restore all things, God. So I pray that they would find hope in Jesus tonight. I pray that they would find strength in the Holy Spirit, Father, to change course, to change direction, and to see you do a mighty work in their families. No matter how old their children are, Father, or how young they are, God, I believe you can work miracles in families, Father, and you can restore and reconcile anything that's been broken. Father, just lead us by your Spirit and lead us well. God, I thank you so much for how good you are to us, how good you are to me. We just glorify your name. In Jesus' name I pray.